This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium blockchain network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. To learn more, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, and welcome to Epicenter. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And my name is Friederike Ernst. We're here today with Nadav Hollander. So we're going to go into the conversation in, in just a bit. He's the founder of the Dharma Protocol, which is this exciting new uh, lending marketplace and lending protocol on Ethereum. Yes, uh, and they've just started building a first application on that protocol, namely Dharma Lever for margin lending. Uh, and we'll talk about that and uh, the business model and uh, where they're going to go. Okay, and with that, let's go to the conversation with Nadav. We're here today with Nadav Hollander. Nadav is the founder of Dharma Protocol. And Dharma is a protocol for lending, loans, and all kinds of debt instruments uh, on Ethereum or on blockchain. So, an interesting project. I've actually met Nadav together with Meher in, in February. We visited him in his apartment, and there were just two people at the time just starting out. And in the meantime, they've made really incredible progress. And, and as I was checking out a little bit what has been built on it and what, what people are doing with it, it's, it they've come an enormously long way in a year. So it's definitely one of those interesting new decentralized finance projects. And I'm really excited that, that you're joining us today, Nadav. Thank you so much, Brian. Appreciate that. So tell us, how did you first become interested in, I guess, this Blockchain and then there's debt. Like which one of those came first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, de definitely blockchain first. Um, let's talk about that. So, um, so I was a student at Stanford uh, studying computer science in 2015, and I had heard about Bitcoin um, and had, like many in the space, sort of dismissed it initially as just being kind of like a bit too fantastical or, or I didn't really see what was particularly like interesting about it or what was particularly useful about it. Um, and it, you know, I never really dove that deep into it. Um, but in 2015, I took a class at Stanford called Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that um, Dan Bonet and Joe Bonneau taught. Um, and I just completely fell in love with the space. And in particular, um, learned a lot about Ethereum, which was, you know, at the time, a very new project. Um, and got really, really excited about that. Um, actually ended up meeting Fred Arsom from Coinbase in that class because he came in and gave a talk, um, Fred Arsom being the co-founder of Coinbase. Um, and eventually like that led to me working at Coinbase as an engineer. I actually started off as an intern there. Um, and it's, it's been down the rabbit hole ever since pretty much. Cool. So, um, and uh, then you uh, you became interested in debt after that. Yeah. So I think like where where I got into um, where I started kind of reading a lot into the history of debt and kind of got interested in the topic in general was as a result of starting to think about like the fact that Coinbase as a company sits on a tremendous amount of cryptocurrency that's just like undeployed. It just sits in its coffers, not accruing interest for um, their users in any way. Um, and I just thought that the idea of having like, wouldn't it be nice if your Bitcoin when it was sitting in Coinbase was earning you some sort of interest rate like it would in a bank? Like that's a really powerful concept to have a bank that is effectively kind of globally accessible that is stateless that anybody with an internet connection can access. Um, and so I started to get like really jazzed about the idea of, you know, interest accruing debt instruments um, in the context of cryptocurrencies. And I was surprised to see that there's uh, really a lack of formal credit markets um, or credit market infrastructure in the cryptocurrency space um, at the time. And so really, that kind of led to me um, both trying to learn a lot about how credit infrastructure has gotten built in the, um, you know, legacy financial system over the years, but also kind of understanding, you know, like what are sort of the early green shoots of a formalized credit market um, in the cryptocurrency world. 
um, and where it likely will start to go um, and eventually end up in the future. And so how did you go about learning about the traditional credit market? So was there any exposure you had to this beforehand? Um, in a formal setting, no. So like definitely, you know, I, I didn't work as like a loan officer at a bank or anything like that, if that's what you're asking. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I picked up a lot of it from osmosis just in terms of like um, basically like going around to a lot of the smartest people that I knew that either worked in the financial industry or uh, worked in some sort of like ancillary financial services um, and kind of just like picking their brains and kind of shopping around the idea of what it would eventually become Dharma um, to them to kind of see what they thought of it. And, you know, in conversations like that, you learn things like, oh, you know, like, you know, sub point A of this thing that you're coming up with doesn't make sense, but actually sub point B, like, you know, solves like X, Y, Z problem for us. And just kind of doing a lot of conversations like that until I kind of picked apart more and more of um, what are the real gaps in the existing sort of credit market infrastructure of the world? And uh, what are the problems to which blockchain tech is actually applicable? And something that was very influential on me from, you know, from a standpoint of getting educated on how, uh, you know, like the, on the history of the world's debt markets um, was a book called Debt the First 5,000 Years. Um, this is a very, very popular book in the cryptocurrency industry. Um, often for actually different reasons than, than my reasons. It's not necessarily like people are excited about it because it, it affirms certain narratives about how money came to be. But yeah, I think it's, a, it's like a fantastic uh, extensive treatise on uh, the history of debt and how it's evolved in the modern world. Cool. So this uh, led you to, to found Dharma. Before we actually deep uh, dive into uh, what the protocol actually does, uh, what does Dharma mean? I mean the name. Yeah, yeah. So, so Dharma, at least in the, uh, the, the Hindu concept, is uh, essentially, and you know, I, I always worry that I'm doing a bit of a, a, a butchering job of translating it. But um, as far as I've understood it, it is effectively like the concept of like obligations or things that you like ought to do. Um, and I thought that uh, in constructing a kind of universal canonical system of debts or obligations um, that it was sort of a fitting concept in many senses. So, so let's dive into uh, the Dharma protocol. I guess first, can you on, on like a very high level describe how does it work and what are the parties that make up the, you know, the, the main players in the protocol? Right. So I think the best way the best way to think about what Dharma protocol is, is I, I like to think of it as like a shared settlement infrastructure for peer to peer lending. So, so what does that mean? Right. Um, let's take an analogous example. Um, I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with the zero X protocol, which has kind of gained a lot of prominence over the past couple of years. Um, the zero X protocol can be thought of as a shared sort of settlement infrastructure that is like a public set of smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain um, that takes kind of like a standard order schema um, that defines like, you know, like party A wants to sell token X to party B, takes that like message and then executes some sort of action on behalf of those two parties. In the case of zero X, the kind of action that it's facilitating is, you know, a trade between two parties. So it takes a you know magic signed string of text that says I you know um, token holder A want to sell token X to token holder B, um, and then it like swaps those tokens out from their two accounts once it validates that the message is correct, uh, aka it settles the actual trade. Dharma is a similar concept but for loans rather than trades, right? So it's basically a shared settlement infrastructure for uh, executing lending transactions where instead of that order essentially saying, um, I, you know, token holder A, want to sell token holder X to token holder B, uh, and it says, instead says, like, I, token holder A, want to lend token X to token holder B. And when it executes that transaction, it both pulls the tokens out of token holder A's account and sends them over to token holder B, um, but also uh, kind of like, initiates the loan agreement um, and kind of creates the contracts that can be used to administer the loan agreement over time. Um, and we'll dive a little bit more into that in a second. 
But um, so that's at a high level kind of the way to think about like what the like whole system is, you know, what the goal of the system is, what its mandate is. Now, um, there are several actors in the Dharma protocol um, that are worth defining. So first of all, we have what are known as relayers. So what relayers do in Dharma is extremely similar to what relayers do in the Zero X protocol, i.e., they essentially host centralized order books that borrowers and lenders can post debt orders and offers onto uh, in order to find other counterparties. So, you know, I gave the example earlier of like token holder A um, uh, wanting to lend like X tokens to token holder B and them kind of coming up with some sort of like magic string that if you give it to the Dharma smart contracts, uh, it would settle the actual loan transaction. Um, that's not particularly useful if token holder A and token holder B don't already know each other, right? They need some sort of way of finding the counterparty. Um, and so that's where relayers come in. And, you know, a very naive model, if I am trying to um, take out a loan, I can go onto a relayer, I can, you know, craft one of these signed messages and basically post it onto the relayer's order book. Um, so that effectively other cryptocurrency users can go and kind of browse through the, or, that order book, look at different debt orders um, and choose which one they want to fill. Um, and the reason why these relayers do this is because they earn a fee every time these loans are actually these loan orders are, are actually filled. Um, so, again, very akin to the concept of relayers in the zero X protocol. Now, there's another class of actors in Dharma, which are called underwriters. So what do underwriters do? Underwriters essentially earn a fee for, um, for playing a few roles. One, they originate borrowers. So they actually like, you know, in some way, shape or form, get the borrower to the doorstep of the relayer, um, be that like programmatically or be that like quite literally, you know, like linking them over there. And then B, they um, they underwrite the risk of the loan, meaning that they um, they make some sort of prediction as to the likelihood of the borrower repaying the given loan, um, and they cryptographically commit to that likelihood um, in a message. So they basically say, like, I believe this borrower has a um, 0.9, you know, you know, a 0.9 percent uh, chance of defaulting on this loan and not repaying, um, and Crucially, the reason why they are held accountable to this prediction is because if that loan is ever actually filled, so if, uh, you know, if somebody eventually does come around and take the other side of the order, then their prediction gets sort of like immutably recorded into the blockchain so that you could, you know, empirically evaluate over time, um, you know, the degree to which uh, an underwriter's predictions have been accurate. Now, there's some caveats around this, and, and we'll probably discuss this a little bit later, but um, that's the basic model. And, and so essentially, the end-to-end the -end flow, when you have both an underwriter and a relayer, um, goes kind of like this. So um, imagine I go on to, um, you know, like www.loans.com, and that, like, you know, the operator of that website is, is you know, in the back end acting as an underwriter. So effectively, I just went there. I don't know anything about Dharma Protocol. I don't know anything about crypto assets. I just want to take out some sort of loan. I, you know, like fill out some sort of form there that says, like, I want to borrow, you know, $100,000. What loans.com is then going to do is they're going to, you know, run their sort of proprietary um, algorithms that are going to determine, like, you know, what my credit worthiness is. Um, they are going to then sort of like display some sort of like, you know, uh, a, sample sort of like term sheet, right? It's going to say like, okay, we can give you $100,000 um, at a uh, 3.14 APR interest rate um, at like XYZ terms. And if I am on board with this, then I'm going to like consent to that. And then they in the back end are going to um, like, um, they're going to sign a message that uh, like essentially is one of these debt orders that I described earlier. Um, but they're going to attach their sort of prediction of my credit worthiness onto there. So you can see that they think that I have a 0.9% chance or whatever of, of defaulting. Then they are going to go and broadcast that order onto different relayers order books. So that like, therefore, a lender can come in and look through those order books and 
essentially choose whether or not they want to invest uh, in my loan. And so effectively, all in all, you have what is what is basically a decentralized distributed credit market um, with different actors who are kind of facilitating the pricing and the counterparty matching of, of different loan issuances. This is decentralized very much on the, send, uh, on the side of the creditor and um, on the relayer. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the underwriter and the debtor, um, you have to know something about them, right? It, this can, can't yeah. be a purely on-chain reputation system that you're building up. Yeah, yeah. So I would definitely say I, I view kind of this first version of the system that we've built as being like heavy on mechanics, light on reputation, right? And so, so we basically built like the very kind of like the very foundational mechanics of how this sort of decentralized credit market can work, but it has a very loose and weak notion of reputation. And what I mean by that is that like the only sort of reputation metrics that you have on a underwriter um, for how good they are at predicting defaults um, is kind of their historical performance. Unfortunately, for a lot of reasons, that historical can, performance can be fairly easily gamed, right? So I, for instance, as an example attack, like I as an underwriter could go and generate a bunch of like fake dummy, um, you know, borrower and lender accounts, um, and then basically simulate a bunch of loans that are all just me lending to myself and, you know, perfectly predict their accuracy every single time um, and kind of build a false sense of reputation. Um, that were somebody to, you know, kind of naively trust this reputation system, I could use to then like defraud them of a certain amount of money. So, so really the, the, the sort of reputation system that, that exists in Dharma today is, is, is a weak reputation system. It's really just kind of a, a, some sort of empirical signal that helps you evaluate whether to trust an underwriter. Um, but, you know, in all of our documentations, we, we always kind of heavily communicate that, like, We communicate two things. A, um, underwriters need to be kind of trusted entities. Like they're not, um, this is not a protocol in which um, you should be willing to trust an underwriter on the basis of simply their, you know, their public key and their, their history. You should also want to know um, kind of what sort of like social capital they have. Like what is their actual like brand, their reputation? Are they like a trusted company? Are they in a regulated sort of jurisdiction? Things like that. And the second thing that we emphasize is that um, for a lot of reasons, unsecured lending in, in Dharma is, is, is kind of an experimental feature set right now. So, so we, really, um, we really, really strongly discourage people from, from uh, doing unsecured loans in meaningful volume right now because kind of as you pointed out, uh, the sort of reputation system that we built into Dharma is, is very naive at the moment. The other thing that I would emphasize or the other the last point that I'd add with respect to uh, underwriters being uh, trusted entities is like the way that I like to think about it is if you were to invest into something like a token sale, um, you would never just invest into like a blind address. Right. You would never just go onto a website that just had like nothing but an address and, um, you know, said like these are the terms at which we're raising at. You're always going to evaluate that investment on the basis of a lot of social cues and signals um, and, you know, like the quality of the white paper and the quality of the team and all this other good stuff. And I view underwriters as being very similar in this regard. Like they, they are effectively facilitating some sort of investment in which you are going to need to kind of like judge on a basis of a lot of social cues how trustworthy they are. And and so I, I view them as as basically being the the fact that it is not a trustless system doesn't mean that it's not valuable uh in terms of the sort of distribution that it um that it begets if you've listened to previous episodes with marley gray and matt kerner you know that microsoft is committed to providing enterprise grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers well the azure blockchain workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks take the ethereum proof of authority template for example It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible proof of authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, 
so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. So you mentioned before, right, that the, the main focus today is to build these like mechanics of these decentralized uh, credit system. Now, I would love to understand how does that compare with, you know, the mechanics of the normal credit system? So, you know, in particular, right, you mentioned underwriter. Of course, underwriters do exist, right, in the traditional world. Mm -hmm. Is there an analogous thing to relayers? So, so like on the one hand, you know, are there particular uh, things that you add that are needed in a decentralized world that are not needed in a traditional world, or maybe things that you're able to remove and entitled parties that you can cut out? Yeah, so I think it's important to evaluate this from, from two perspectives. One is the perspective of the initial issuance. And then the second is is kind of the context of like secondary markets and how these instruments get traded around after they've been issued. So if you think about it, like the the number of hops between, um, you know, like when you put your dollar into a bank account and when it eventually gets utilized by some sort of borrower um, is fairly immense. Like there's kind of like a, a an insane amount of different like intermediaries that um, kind of like stand in between um, your dollar in and like the dollar out that gets lent out to somebody. And the problem is, is that a lot of these intermediaries are uh, not necessarily operating in like uh, a highly kind of programmatic sort of efficient manner. They're, you know, very old world financial types. Um, and so like, you know, to give like a, a super um, simplified crude example here, um, let's just say your your money is kind of accruing interest in some sort of pension fund. And that pension fund then goes and buys like a CDO or collateralized debt obligation which contains like, um, you know, thousands and thousands of different mortgages packaged up into like a fancy instrument. And the administrator of that, in, of, the, uh, of the collateralized debt obligation is taking some sort of cut on that. Um, and then one layer down from there, um, you have like some sort of like, um, some sort of like bank that is actually issuing those mortgages. Um, and they're the ones who sold the mortgages to the CDO administrator. That bank is similarly in some way, shape or form going to be taking a cut from the dollar that that went in there. And then like a layer down, you have some sort of like originator that actually went and found the um, the borrower and advertised to them and got them to the doorstep. Um, and that originator is similarly taking some sort of pound of flesh and, you know, so on and so forth. And so the point is, is like, um, you know, I, there there are. Um, there are intermediaries in the Dharma credit market and there are intermediaries in the traditional financial system. Um, but our kind of hope and our goal with building Dharma is that um, at least in, in, in Dharma, those intermediaries will all be kind of um, entirely programmatically accessible from anywhere in the world. And B, like they will be like highly minimized in what they can do. Um, as in like, you know, like the, the sort of trust that you need to place in them will be, will be minimized or the, the kind of attack surface of what the bad things that they can do can be minimized. And then three, they'll be like almost entirely transparent as in like any sort of, uh, you know, anything that they may do that is fraudulent or anything that they may do, um, that, um, is good will be kind of auditable on chain. And so, so that's kind of the way that I like to think about, um, the what the Dharma credit market does for initial issuance in comparison to um, the existing financial system. Now, there's a whole a whole other topic conversation about how um, about how Dharma factors into secondary trading of different debt instruments. Um, but that's that's a little bit of an esoteric rabbit hole that I think maybe maybe we can save for another time. Oh, that's super interesting. Um, so in principle, the Dharma protocol is pretty bare bones. Uh, as it is. So in principle, the, the any loan can be structured um, as a debtor and an underwriter together see fit, uh, as long as mm -hmm. the creditor actually buys it. Um, so in principle, I don't actually need to collateralize my loan at all, um, or maybe with my reputation. So basically, basically, if I, if I uh, 
borrow money from Brian. Uh, Brian will know that uh, uh, that we work in the same office and uh, we will see each other uh, many days uh, and that it will be really awkward if I don't pay back. But uh, what what collaterals do you actually expect to see first? And this is kind of moving into the into the Dharma. So you you, you pioneer this Dharma lever that actually works on top of Dharma. Uh, so right, right, right. So so yeah, I mean, the way that we see Dharma evolving is that we we think that the first use cases for decentralized lending that are really going to take off. Um, are those that have like the least sort of external dependencies on the real world. Um, and those at the moment happen to be kind of collateralized on chain by other crypto assets. So, you know, they don't really rely on any notions of off chain reputation or identity. And, you know, like the reason why we think that these are the most relevant or useful in the short term is that it's, you know, as we discussed earlier, like the, the reputation system for underwriters is fairly undeveloped. It's, it's fairly primitive in many senses. So though, yes, in theory, today you could go and take out an unsecured loan via Dharma. Um, it's, it's not an extremely scalable sort of system for that right now. Like, it, you know, it's, it'd be really um, it'd be really hard for there to be like, you know, thousands of different underwriters um that we're all doing unsecured loans and it would be hard for a creditor then to be able to evaluate which ones to actually trust um so with that being said our focus in the short term is instead to facilitate to essentially like uh, evangelize dharma's usage as the sort of canonical credit market for for collateralized loans just to like get the actual distribution mechanism kind of embedded into the cryptocurrency ecosystem and then over time to start to layer on kind of more sophisticated notions of reputation um, that enable things like unsecured loans. And so you ask kind of what sort of things would be used as collateral um, in the context of these collateralized loans. And basically, um, far and beyond the biggest category here is just other crypto tokens, right? So like really, um, you know, a classic example would be like, I hold a bunch of Ether. And I don't want to sell my ether. I want to like keep holding on to it, or I don't want to incur you know some sort of tax liability or what have you. Um, but I want some sort of stable liquidity. Um, so what I can do is I can basically post an order onto the Dharma credit market saying I am willing to put up you know X amount of ether as collateral and uh, get you know like some amount of USD coin or Dai or what have you lent to me against that. Um, and the value of that USD coin or die would be less than um, the total notional value of the collateral that I've put up. And so there's there's really like the, the lending use cases that are enabled by this um, primarily fall into the category of like, like speculative, like um, uh, borrowing, like it's basically like, uh, taking on margin positions, like if you want to like lever up your position in a certain crypto asset, or you want to short uh, a certain crypto asset, like this is uh, this is a great mechanism for doing that. And this is kind of what we see as being like the primary beachhead for decentralized lending today. Um, and this is this is what we are primarily focused on in the moment. And if you'd like, I'm more than happy to kind of dive into uh, lever in our efforts there. Yeah, no, it would be great. And, and of course, it's pretty, uh, on, on some level, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. It, it makes perfect sense as a use case. But on some level, it is quite funny that, you know, in this hyper volatile space, right? Now you can like lever up more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so. Um, I think that's a wrong way to think about it, though. <laughs> and, and, and the reason why I'd say that is that, um, so first of all, like, yes, like, you know, like, it's it's kind of wild that people take on leverage um, in the crypto as the cryptocurrency space, and they do it a lot. Um, and you know, I, I can't necessarily say that's like you know sound investing strategy to to do that and how in in an extra volatile market as is. Um, but you know, teach their own. Um, but I think it's also important to realize that um, that like margin loans can be used to to short assets as well right so to basically like bet on them going down in value and that's really really important for kind of bringing maturity to a market um because if you because kind of like if you don't have kind of like short pressure on an asset um then it is more likely to be like extremely volatile whereas like 
if um, if traders have a means of actually doing things like shorting, you know, Denticoin or what have you, um, they will do so. And that's going to pressure the price down and that's going to kind of add another price signal into the market that's going to help make things more rational. And so so I, I think it's a bit more nuanced than saying, like, you know, this is like providing like, um, you know, hot dice to a like uh, to like gambling addicts. It's really it's more it's more about like building kind of like the the basic fixtures of a credit market or a ba- basic fixtures of a sophisticated trading market so that prices can become more rational. So so t- talking about lever, right? So you can I I would it be possible to kind of borrow any Ethereum asset and put up any Ethereum asset as a collateral or how does it work? Yeah, so so really quickly what what is lever? Um so lever um, is the first underwriter um, in the Dharma ecosystem that we are building. And so to be clear, anybody can build underwriters in Dharma. We, we don't gate that in any way, but we in particular, for, for reasons that we can discuss perhaps later when we're talking about things like business model, um, have chosen to, to build this first underwriter. Um, and the market that this underwriter is focused on is basically like high volume margin loans for anybody in the world that has an internet connection. And so I, the way I like to think about what Lever is as a product is, is kind of like a, a shapeshift for loans almost, where you, you can kind of show up on a website, you say, I want to borrow ETH collateralized by, you know, um, DAI, we'll give that example again. Um, Lever will then go out um, and kind of scan through the Dharma credit market and find like the best sort of offer um, that fits your parameters. Um, it will then sort of display that uh, offer to you. You will then be able to go and send your crypto assets to some sort of address um, and then instantly receive um, the, your, your principal kind of sent to you. And all the sort of complexity of actually you know, like filling the loan uh, on the Dharma smart contracts and interacting with Ethereum nodes and all that sort of th- stuff is abstracted away from the end user. So you have this like very simple web 2.0 style um, product uh, that wraps around the entire experience. And so that's what Lever is. So so it's just on Lever, let's say I, I want to, I'm going to, I want to put in some DAI as collateral and borrow some Ether. And then this DAI gets held in a smart contract or? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so the collateral is, is, is like sort of trustlessly escrowed in a smart contract. The only conditions on which it's like released is either if the um, user defaults, uh, in which case like the collateral kind of automatically gets liquidated for the principal um, and kind of like the the um, remaining principal is sent to the to the lender and the remaining collateral is sent to the borrower um, or in the case of a, a margin call. So if, if the kind of if the the price of the underlying collateral um, drops to a certain point where um, the loan is no longer over collateralized, then there is a sort of liquidation mechanism for for making sure that the lender doesn't doesn't lose their capital. Um, so 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 all in all, like the system is is still kind of the the crypto assets are collateraled by smart contracts and not kind of custodied by some sort of arbitrary trusted third party. Okay, so you're you're talking about two ways of uh, closing the loan. Presumably, as a borrower, I can also just uh, return the loan, right? Right, right, right. So yeah, the, the the third way in which you can access your collateral is just making kind of repayment in full. In which case, the your entire kind of collateral deposit is returned to you. Ah, cool. That makes complete sense. Um, so so let me go into the liquidation process. So uh, presumably, um, if uh, if the value of the asset I have put up as collateral drops in value, um, mm. or I fail to make interest payments, um, my asset gets uh, gets liquidated. So how can you take me through um, how this liquidation actually happens? Yeah, sure. So basically, um, there is a price feed that is kind of uh, kind of periodically informing the chain of, of what the price of the two assets is with respect to each other. And effectively, the, what the smart contract is doing is it is using that price feed to keep track of what the loan to value ratio is of that given loan. The loan to value ratio being essentially the ratio of the value of the principal that's been lent out to the value of the collateral that's that's underlying it. 
And once that L, like the LTV or loan to value ratio crosses a certain threshold, the loan becomes eligible for liquidation. So what happens then is that anybody can come to that smart contract um, with uh, a amount of the principal that is sufficient to repay the lender and basically purchase the collateral in the smart contract with that principal at the current price. So essentially, like, you know, if to give a quick example, if I um, if we if we have a zero interest rate loan that is for one hundred dollars USD and is collateralized by one hundred and fifty dollars worth of ether. And for some reason, we have now kind of um, liquidated this loan, um, then I as a liquidator can come in and I have like one hundred dollars and I get one hundred dollars in USD. And I can purchase a hundred dollars worth of ether from the smart contract in USD um, or USD coin or whatever, and then the contract is going to take that USD coin, return it to the lender. Um, it's going to take the remaining collateral and send it back to the the borrower. And the reason why I, as a liquidator, would want to do this is um, is kind of twofold. Like either a, I am the like underwriter, so you know, in the case of like lever. Um, you know, like we are initially going to be doing a lot of this because, you know, we are underwriting these loans. We have an interest in seeing them be kind of serviced correctly. We have an interest in making sure that lenders aren't going to lose money, et cetera. Um, and we're also earning a fee as an underwriter. So we're being compensated for this. Or there's some sort of optional liquidation discount on the actual underlying collateral, in which case, like there is a sort of like arbitrage opportunity here where we can go and, you know, use our hundred dollars to purchase, you know, like the hundred dollars worth of ether at some sort of discount and then immediately sell it at the real market rate um, so that we make some sort of delta there. Um, and so so that's kind of the the basic liquidation mechanism. Because uh, that's how it works in Baker, know that you have a, a, a discount or basically a penalty that gets paid by whoever gets liquidated. So but here that's not yeah, I'd say that we, yeah, the, the system, Maker's system is, it has a lot of kind of parameters to it that are sort of um, optimized for um, creating a stable coin and like really disincenting defaults um, to a really big degree because it kind of like um, chips away the stability of the stable coin every time that happens. And so, so really like, you know, like I think Maker has like a default penalty, penalty of like 13% or something like that. Um, and so like, uh, in the case of Dharma, we don't have these same sorts of constraints. Like we don't need to, we don't need to impose these sorts of like very, very sort of draconian rules. And so you don't see those same sorts of mechanisms used in, in the context of Dharma. So basically the discount that, uh, that you're given for purchasing this loan, does this depend on the kind of collateral that I put up? Because basically there, there are many kinds of tokens that if you actually purchase them, um, you, you're influencing price quite heavily. So basically, they just don't have a, a good market depth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. basically, if, if it's a large-ish position um, and you go on to any decentralized exchange or often even centralized exchanges, you move the price a lot just by actually purchasing uh, that amount of token at market price. Um, mm -hmm. Is that factored into that somehow? So yeah, that's that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, so basically, the the liquidation discount or the fee that the underwriter earns, which again they're kind of interchangeable for how you want to compensate um, a liquidator for coming in, is absolutely like you know it, if so it, it's parameterizable, right? It's like part of the order that um, that gets like broadcasted onto different relayers. Um, so you can it can go from zero to infinity, right? Um, and, or at least in the case of the liquidation discount, zero to a hundred percent. And so, um, and so, yeah, what you described is exactly accurate, right? Like, is like, if, um, a, a big factor in, that goes into deciding what that discount should be or what that, um, fee should be is the liquidity of the underlying collateral. Um, because in particular, if it's, if the system is based on the liquidation discount, um, in order for you to like execute that arbitrage you have to like cross the spread twice um, and basically like, uh, you know, like purchase the collateral and then immediately sell it thereafter. Um, and in particularly illiquid assets, 
that spread can be very, very wide and you can be like losing, you know, like two, four percent or something like that um, just by crossing the spread. And so for that reason, like the yeah, you are 100 percent correct in saying that, like the liquidity is a big reason uh, why that fee is parameterizable. Cool. This this is super interesting. That that leads me to my next question. So basically, how, how, where do you get your price feed? Because basically, if in in principle, liquidation then can be an enormously profitable endeavor. So basically, if you get a price feed and you can somehow manipulate the price feed um, as mm -hmm. a liquidator, uh, that gives you a way to game the entire system. No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so so initially, we are going to be like running our own price feeds as a sort of trusted operator um and then you know in particular like like i mentioned earlier we are the underwriter of these loans and so you know i actually think this this is an excellent example of of where you have sort of like earlier i spoke about how like underwriters are meant to be kind of like um trusted but like trust minimized in a sense like how you how you like you want to minimize the amount of trust assumptions you have to make about them um, and so I think Dharma Lever is an excellent example in this sense, because Lever is the underwriter of these loans that it's originating. And for the most, like for, for most aspects of the loan process, you don't need to trust Lever, the underwriter, right? Like you don't need to trust us with respect to um, making sure that the loan is actually collateralized. You don't need to trust us with respect to making sure that the loan has like some sort of liquidation mechanism that's going to happen to that. All of these things are managed and administered by smart contracts. The only thing you need to trust Lever, the underwriter, with respect to is, is operating this price feed correctly and accurately. Um, and, so, and so, yes, there is somewhat of a trust assumption. Yes, there is a way in which Lever could defraud you, but you have some sort of auditable track record where you can see, well, OK, the price feed that they've been using for the past you know, like two years has like always been accurate within like some sort of uh, confidence interval. And so, and so I view this as like an excellent example of what what I think the, the first underwriters in the Dharma network are going to look like, i.e. like trust minimized actors. They're really, um, they, they have some trust assumptions baked into them, um, but they're, they're like, you know, either trust assumptions that can easily be verified, um, you know, ex post facto or um, like, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically the, the gist of what I'm trying to say. So you mentioned, right, that, Basically, Dharma is a, a trusted party to some extent in this context. And so what, what does the regulatory profile look like for Dharma Lever? Is this going to be accessible to anyone or is it going to be restricted to, you know, accredited investors? Do you guys need some sort of license to do this? Yeah, so I think the with respect to accessibility, at the moment we are planning on having the product be accessible to both retail and accredited investors. With that being said, like we're not going to go kind of like full, um, you know, anonymous DEX style um, origination, right? Like we are going to be KYCing customers that come in. Um, because we're going to be accepting fees. And if, you know, if you are domiciled in the United States and you're accepting fee revenue from pretty much anybody, you like need to make sure you're KYCing them. And so the system will have at least a little bit of gating in that capacity. Now, you, you, you asked a, an interesting question about, you know, what sort of licenses we may need to, you know, get in order to, to operate this business in a compliant manner. Um, and the what's what's interesting is that though lever is um like effectively facilitating the the liquidations and is facilitating the origination of these loans um lever is a non-custodial product right like we are never like actually like touching people's principal and um you know executing actions on their behalf in any way and so it's not necessarily like akin to say like a lending club um, as a peer-to-peer -peer lending provider where lending club actually like stores your dollars and could, you know, in theory, if you, if lending club went out of business, you could not have access to your dollars anymore. We are more so effectively um, like a kind of like um, interface for the underlying Dharma credit market from which you are finding your, your credit liquidity. Um, and so what that means, and, and you know, I, I can't necessarily dive into this in a super sort of like deep manner on this podcast right now, 
Um, but it, it really creates a very nuanced regulatory analysis of like what this product's role is in from from a regulatory standpoint. Um, because it's it's not very accurate to describe it as a money transmitter. It's not very accurate to describe it as a money service business because there's not an actual sort of component of it that involves us touching people's money um, so much as like us just acting as like a nice interface that that bundles up the operations of the underlying Dharma credit market uh, in a way that's easy for users to to interact with. Oh, that's interesting. So there there are regulations that actually touch these type type of marketplaces, but I think maybe this is not the the, the place and time to go into that. Um, there are cup there are a couple of uh, projects that, that do very similar things uh, that have sprung up in the recent uh, months. So such as Compound, DYDX, and Box. Um, mm -hmm. How do you how do you see yourself uh, in relation to them? Where do you think your strengths are? Where do you see your position uh, in the ecosystem? I think Compound and DYDX are the one, or the two that I'll dive into right now, um, because they're they're the ones that I'm most familiar with. So they, they both are very different uh, in in their own respective ways. So if you look at Compound, for instance, like Compound is a money market and and not a peer to peer lending market. And so what that means is that like any lender that uh, puts their money into the like uh, Compound market for a given asset. Um, is guaranteed the same rate that the, all of the other lenders have, and that rate floats over time on the basis of of like supply and demand. And that what's great about that is that you know with Compound, like in one click you can like start earning your interest right away, and that's really really cool. Um, but the problem with that is that if you have an imbalance in the in the market where there are you know a lot more lenders than there are borrowers, which is exactly what the the crypto market looks like right now then there's this really uncomfortable situation where uh, in order to make sure that all the lenders are getting the same interest rates, the lenders get like a really, really low interest rate, like sub 1%. And then individual borrowers have to get charged really high interest rates in order to compensate like all of those lenders. Uh, and so again, it's really just like you have a sort of trade off here in, in, the, in the design of compound as a money market where on one hand, Both the lend and borrow side have instant access to what they're trying to do, which is awesome. Um, but on the other hand, that lends itself to having often like less attractive interest rates. So Dharma, on the other hand, is like an order based protocol. So instead of there being like, um, you know, you as a lender put your like money up and immediately start earning interest for it. Instead, you as a lender uh, sign a debt offer and broadcast that offer. You basically say, I'm willing to lend this much at this rate, um, kind of like you would post an order onto an exchange's order book. And then if somebody else eventually comes around and says, I'll take you up on that, that rate sounds great to me, um, then your assets start earning interest for you. And so you know, not all lenders in the Dharma system are guaranteed to earn some sort of interest rate. It's only those whose orders get filled. And so, and so what that means is that, um, you know, again, going back to this sort of like trade-off analysis, um, you don't necessarily have like, at least from like the lend side, a, a instant access to earning interest rates, but um, because there's like, there isn't a sort of guaranteed interest rate for all parties that are in the system, that means that um, lenders can get higher interest rates on the Dharma credit market. And similarly, borrowers can get lower interest rates on the Dharma credit market. Um, so it's really kind of like uh, a trade-off space uh, be between those two, those two different projects. Now, with respect to DYDX, DYDX is, is much more similar to, to Dharma in this regard in that it's based on like an order protocol. And, and many different elements of the system are, 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 are very, very similar to, to how, we designed, um, how we designed Lever. But um, I'd say like the biggest difference is that the underlying smart contracts um, of like the of Dharma Lever are just like the general Dharma credit market, which is built to be like a generic credit market that can be used for things other than just margin loans. Um, and so we view that as like a, a, a sort of strategic differentiator where we can do margin loans and also, you know, like crypto kitties backed loans and things like that and uh, use the same sort of underlying infrastructure to have that be served by a unified credit market. But um, with that being said, you know, at this point in time where everybody is using decentralized lending 
the only thing people are using decentralized lending for is for you know speculative loans, um, I'd say that the projects do look very similar. Interesting. So um, as the space matures, uh, I I assume you will move into um, into you'll move away or you'll move uh, to other projects than Dharma level, um, such as applications that are looking uh, that look into um, more illiquid assets. So, for instance, say I want to uh, take out a loan on my company or uh, a mortgage on my house um, that are not as easily uh, gaugeable as uh, as the tokens uh, that uh, I have to put out uh, have to put uh, out as collateral on uh, Dharma level. Um, as far as I know, you guys haven't actually done uh, an ICO. What's what's your business model going to look like? Uh, and how is it going to be different for um, those very straightforward Dharma lever type applications and for other applications building on top, on top of the Dharma protocol? Yeah, so so we definitely, we took an approach where we decided not to do an ICO during the kind of 2017 craze. Um, and in particular, right now, we're quite happy with that decision because, um, it, frankly, um, we have enough sort of regulatory issues and analysis that we need to worry about in our day to day operations. I think adding, you know, like the whole world of securities law and, you know, unregistered securities issuances to, to that um, is just another reason not to sleep at night. And so um, the way in which we plan on making money is kind of building out ancillary services and businesses on top of the Dharma credit market. The first one being Lever, right? And so like Lever is an underwriter in the Dharma credit market. Um, we think that it's going to bring a lot more volume to the Dharma credit market. We think that's going to incentivize a lot more relayers to join. And that's going to incentivize a lot of other underwriters to join. And that's going to be great. And that's going to you know continue to bring more liquidity to, to Dharma Lever and make us more money and et cetera. Um, and so, so really like the, the short-term business model, like in this immediate like year, is very much focused around like lever and making sure like you know we are earning fee revenue through lever and that fee mind you is like the underwriter fee that we're taking uh, which is baked into the protocol but in the future i think that we want to kind of start like spinning up um taking the lessons that we learned from building lever and spinning up like other types of underwriters um in other sort of related industries and so um you can imagine that looking like us spinning up an underwriter for um lending to miners, for instance, for instance, or um, spinning up an underwriter for um, uh, lending to, you know, various like um, uh, crypto protocols that need credit liquidity, like, um, uh, for instance, like, like layer two scalability protocols. And that's, that's a whole subtopic of its own that I can, that can cover. And so there's a lot of really interesting kind of businesses that can be spun up around it. But, but at the moment, our focus is on um, you know, like we've built and deployed the underlying Dharma credit market. We are now building the first underwriter in that credit market. Um, it is an open market. There can be many other underwriters, but we, um, you know, like our goal is to kind of earn our, our pound of flesh uh, by earning fees as that underwriter. Do you think at some point there's going to be a role or a necessity to have some kind of token in the Dharma protocol? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. I think that, you know, we spend a ton of time thinking about like token models and which ones do and don't make sense. Um, I think that the two categories, so so first of all, to give the quick answer, the quick answer is like, maybe, I don't know. Um, like, you know, there, there's always, there's there's definitely a possibility that at some point in the future, it will be become clear that, um, you know, there's a gap in the protocol in X way and that a token would help solve that gap. And if we truly believe that, like, you know, there is a, a good model that would add value to our ecosystem um, and also like capture value to some degree, then we probably would pursue something like a token. So what are the models that we think potentially make sense in this regard? And I will heavily caveat by saying, like, this is highly, highly speculative. Like, we don't have any plans of doing an ICO right now. We don't have any plans of issuing a token or anything like that. Like, this is just totally just the kind of hand wavy speculation. So those two models are either like governance tokens or um, what I would kind of define as like um, almost like an insurance token. And, and, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that in a second. So so the first um, is, you know, like kind of the same uh, when we're talking about governance tokens in the context of a sort of public settlement infrastructure like Dharma, 
um, then the best sort of analog to think of is 0x, right? So, so ZRX is the governance token of the, like the 0x settlement infrastructure, and it can be used, uh, or, you know, in theory, it will be used in the future to um, govern upgrades to the 0x protocol. Now, the, the problem with this model is that it's, it's, it's unclear the degree to which it is valuable to govern upgrades to that settlement infrastructure, even if it is entirely broadly adopted by like everyone in the industry. Because it's not clear that the switching costs between using, say, 0x protocol or using um, you know, a forked version of 0x protocol are that high. Um, you know, if, the, if the switching costs were super high, then there would be a very like compelling case to be made for why you know we need to have some sort of governance mechanism in place. Um, but if it's just a, a question of like you know like setting my token permissions to like some other set of smart contracts, then it's it, it's not entirely clear whether it's necessary for there to be uh, kind of community governance of the actual like settlement infrastructure. But again, what I'd also emphasize is like. Um, you know, it's very possible that I'm wrong here. It's very possible that there is value to these sorts of governance tokens, et cetera. Um, so, so again, all the more reason why we we have not rushed into building something like this into our protocol. The second token model that I think is really interesting is what I would define as kind of like an insurance token. And, and this is a really crude word to describe it, but uh, the, the, the best analog that I can think of is is kind of MKR in the context of Maker. So MKR is, is, is actually a governance token and also an insurance token in this regard. And, and what I mean by an insurance token is that like the token acts, the token holders act as the sort of lender of last resort to the, um, uh, to the maker system. So if the maker system in, in basically in certain cases, the MKR token will be like inflated and sold in order to facilitate some sort of action in the maker system or to like kind of compensate some people if something goes really, really badly wrong. Um, And I view this as being kind of an interesting token model where basically a bunch of people purchase like what is effectively kind of like a share in their belief that the smart contracts of this system are kind of soundly designed and that the economics of the system are soundly designed. And um, it's almost like they are earning like some sort of premium on an insurance policy in a sense where you know in theory if the system is is very very like is functioning very well the the value of the token is going to go up and if the system um actually ends up kind of like defaulting or breaking in some way then you know your your token is going to get it, to get basically inflated to zero and so i think that these are actually like very interesting token models that we'll probably start to see a lot uh, a lot more frequently in the wild um, with Maker being probably the best proof point for it. So in the context of Dharma, the idea would then be that if I'm an underwriter, I can opt in to use some sort of, you know, almost premium insurance service by leveraging this token or or would this become like a mandatory yeah, yeah, that's kind of the way I would think about it exactly. Um, it's like you would have this sort of like opt-in insurance policy that you could kind of like uh, like be looped into. Um, again, highly speculative. I, I really there's a lot of questions around like how would you um, how do you underwrite that risk? How do you like you know underwrite the risk of different under like like how do you um, permission which underwriters can use that like you know things like that. But uh, I, I think that those sorts of models are, are very interesting um, because, yeah, I, I just think that it, it, it's, it's something that uniquely leverages the abilities of tokens to be like inflated and deflated um, programmatically. Cool. Well, we're about coming to the end of our conversation, but it would be just good to hear from you a little bit. What... What is sort of the long-term vision you have for both Dharma and kind of decentralized finance in general? Like, where do you what what impact do you see this having on the world in the next you know ten years? So I think what what gets me really excited about decentralized finance is that um, effectively it it really drastically lowers the barrier of entry to building and delivering financial services to people. And so if you think about it, like today, if I want to spin up some sort of like financial services company, let's just say I want to spin up a lending company, 
there's there's a lot of hoops that I have to jump through, right? I have to um, not only get all the sort of the regulatory licensure that it requires that is required to be a lender, but I have to actually go and like raise lending capital. I have to go and get like a credit facility and I have to go like knock on a lot of bankers doors and convince them to lend me a bunch of money so that I can go and then lend that money out myself. And that's like a really bespoke and sort of like rote process. Um, and if you look at what the internet did to, to most businesses, that it, what it did to like, you know, e-commerce, what it did to um, kind of like uh, social networks, et cetera, um, is it really, really drastically lowered the, the barrier to entry for building a business and delivering products to people. All you have to do is just go and spin up a website, um, you know, have a little Stripe checkout flow, and all of a sudden I can sell anyone in the world digital products. Uh, and even deliver it directly to them through the internet. It's a really powerful idea. What I think decentralized finance is going to do is it's going to extend that to the world of financial services, where now all of a sudden it becomes very, very easy to spin up a lending company, or it comes becomes very easy to spin up like in a, a arbitrage hedge fund that like arbitrages different like uh, um, markets in the decentralized finance world, or it'll become very easy to spin up like a um, a internet based kind of bank where people can earn their own sorts of uh, where people can earn interest rates from anywhere in the world. And the idea here is, is isn't necessarily to say that like each one of these financial services will be better than their analog counterparts so much as to say that there will just be a lot more competition. Like we will have so many more entrants into the into the financial services market that um, the sort of quality of them will go up and the prices of them will go down. Uh, at the same time. And so, and so the, my vision for, for what I think decentralized finance is going to be is, is essentially a world in which the same sort of like um, hyper globalization that um, the internet did to consumer products um, and the sort of like massive increase in quality and decrease in price that you saw come from that when you kind of lowered those barriers to entry in the context of consumer internet products is going to happen in the context of financial services as well. Um, and so our hope with Dharma is to kind of build the canonical lending infrastructure that slots into that broader decentralized financial vision, um, and on top of which kind of the financial services of the future are built. Cool. Well, that's well articulated. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Adolf. It was, uh, I think, absolutely amazing project and, and great how much how quickly you progress. So um, I look forward to seeing what you guys will build in the years to come. Thanks, Brian. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And thank you, Frederica. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.